set temperature to 23. Play song, A Day in the Life. You know Dora. Delicioso! Can you say delicioso? She, she'll grow out of it. Think again. Dora, this isn't the jungle. It's high school. It's life or death. So if I don't talk to you, don't take it personal, okay? We're all just trying to survive. High school's a horrible nightmare. Uh, excuse me? Uh, kind of stuck. Who are you? I'm glad you brought it up. I'm just kidding. I don't actually care. We're on to something big, Dora. An ancient city made of gold. We're gonna break some rules. We're coming with you, Prima. Oh, look. Dora brought a knife on the field trip, everybody. It's a jungle puzzle. Stop pulling levers! <laughs> the jungle is perfectly safe. Ah, not safe! Not safe! Seriously, you had that in your backpack too? Come on, boots. Dora and the Lost City of Gold. Quick, Sandra! Don't panic. <laughs> Excuse me. I ate chili con carne. <laughs> Wait, PG.
Hello and welcome to my channel. On today's video we are going to look at some of the most amazing and beautiful tiaras worn by queens and princess, in the realm of royalty, pageantry, and nobles. Throughout history, men and women of status have adorned their foreheads with various kind of crowns and tiaras, which symbolized social superiority and power. The fashion of wearing precious tiaras has fluctuated with history and gone in tandem with society's appetite for egalitarianism or elitism, but it has not vanished. The downfall of many European monarchies might have diminished its importance, but curiously, the notion of elitism and dream of being a princess, even for one day, has continued to seduce generations and tiara has remained in fashion, in its classical styles as well as in new art forms. Most royal watchers instantly recognized the glittering diadem as Queen Mary's lover's knot tiara, often shortened to the lover's knot. The lover's knot tiara was commissioned for Queen Mary in 1913 from Britain's House of Garrett. It consists of diamonds and a collection of 19 hanging pearls, all set in silver and gold. Later it was handed down to Queen Elizabeth. She then eventually gave it to her daughter-in-law, Princess Diana. It was through Diana that Love Is Not became one of the most recognizable pieces of jewelry belonging to the British royal family. She famously paired it with a white, pearl-encrusted Catherine Walker ensemble while visiting Hong Kong in 1989. Upon her divorce from Prince Charles, the tiara was returned to Queen Elizabeth as part of the divorce deal. Kate Middleton didn't wear the lover's knot tiara for the first few years of her royal tenure. On her wedding day, Kate Middleton wore the Cartier Halo tiara. Then, for other formal occasions, most notably at the state dinner for Chinese President Xi Jinping, she donned the lotus flower tiara. However, in December 2015, she wore the lover's knot for that year's diplomatic reception. Immediately, comparisons to Diana were made. Since then, it's become the Duchess's formal headwear of choice. Ninth on the list is the Marie Threes, Duchess d'Angouli Emerald and Diamond Tiara. The tiara which was designed and executed by the French royal jewelers Everard and Frederick Pabst in 1819, was a masterpiece of the French jewelry craftsmanship of the early 19th century. The design of the tiara was a symmetrical design of scrolling foliage mounted with over a thousand diamonds set in silver, and forty emeralds set in gold. The silver and gold lines of the settings are clearly visible in the photograph of the tiara. The tiara survived the French Revolution and was hidden away together with other royal treasure, eventually the tiara was sold in an auction to an English aristocrat. It was on display at the Albert and Victoria Museums for several years until the owner of the celebrated tiara successfully negotiated a deal with the Louvre Museum, that brought him the returns he expected. Thus the emerald and diamond tiara of the Duchess d'Angoulême, Marie III's Charlotte, the only child of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette to survive the French Revolution, finally became the property of the Louvre Museum, where it is displayed today. Eighth on the list is the Lynn Aquamarine Tiara. A tiara that comes to us courtesy of the Belgian noble house of Lynn. The Lynn family have held their titles for centuries, but this tiara is a thoroughly modern addition to the extended family's jewel collection. In 2009, Prince Edouard de Lynn de la Tremoyle married Italian actress, Isabella Orsini. This beautiful diamond and aquamarine tiara was made for the occasion. The sparkler, which was created by Hollemans, features a large central aquamarine book ended by smaller aquamarines. And, because this is a lintiara after all, the piece also incorporates diamond script less as a major feature of the design. Isabella also wore aquamarine earrings, to coordinate with the diadem. The universal themes of nature, strength, beauty, femininity and unity. 
the Mwawad Miss Universe Tiara 2019 begun life like this, as inspiration. The designers was asked of crafting the extraordinary tiara embracing the values of the Miss Universe, and translate them to diamond studded crown, that represent, ambition, diversity, community, and beauty. This tiara came to life in a meticulous process, that combined the artistry and creative vision, using technology, master craftsmen, and the expertise to source and polish diamonds to the highest standard. The tiara's name The Power of Unity, is meant to celebrate a women for being complex, diverse, unapologetically ambition, and strong. The interconnected line motifs are, are meant to represent the community of women from around the world whose band unite them, and reminds us that we are stronger than apart. Sixth on the list, is this beautiful emerald tiara from the collection of Princess Katharina Henkel von Donsmark in the 1900. I think it is difficult to exaggerate the importance of this emeralds. This is the undoubtedly the greatest raw of original fabulous stones, 11 of them perfectly match. And what is extraordinary, is that, if you want to describe it to somebody, what color the great emerald is you would point at this stones. They are like green berries, it's what is known as the old mine material. The emeralds itself is absolutely remarkable, it is estimated the weight to be well over 500 carats, which is a huge amount. They would have been mine in Colombia, probably in the 16th century, and they would have been traded with India. The emeralds are typical of, a way of wearing emeralds, in India in the 17th century, cutting them in a way of almost rolled pebbled bids, and characters will be drilled along the main axis, with this rather thick drill holes. So, one can easily imagine that this could worn around the neck by a Maharaja or a Prince. And then, subsequently finding its way into France in the turn of the 19th century. There's really no period in European history where jewelry was more glamorous and more abundant, than the better part of end of the 19th century. Prince Guido Henkel von Donsmark was at that time the richest man in German and one of the richest men in Europe. In 1887 he married a Russian aristocrat, Katharina Sleptsov, and this tiara was commissioned for her as a gift. Donsmark commissioned this tiara from Chormy. The design of the tiara, the base of the tiara is typical of the late 19th century. Very delicate garden forms set in diamonds and studded with this large cushion pale yellow diamond, which contrast perfectly with the emeralds. Fifth on the list is the Queen Alexandra's Kokoschnik tiara. There are so many reasons to love Queen Alexandra's Kokoschnik. It's an utterly classic tiara from a design perspective. It's a literal wall of diamonds. It has a fascinating, Romanov related backstory. The original design of the tiara was worn by Empress Marie Fodorovna of Russia. Then after it was seen by her sister Queen Alexandra, she already knew what she wanted on her wedding day. In 1888 the London News illustrated the Alexandra's anniversary present, a Kokoschnik design tiara made by the royal jeweler, the House of Garrett. Like Marie Fodorovna's tiara, the piece was made of individual paveset bars, though Alexandra's fringes were more rounded at the tip. Alexandra's Kokoschnik featured 77 of these fringe pieces, and the entire tiara was packed with more than 400 diamonds. One of the tiara's first appearances at a major royal occasion came a few years later, when Alexandra wore the diadem at the 1893 wedding of her second son, the Duke of York, later King George V, and Princess Mary of Tech. In portraits taken on that day, the flexibility of the tiara is apparent, the fringes are not bunched tightly together, and spaces are visible between the bars. 
Alexandru appears to have used another jewel, possibly a bracelet, to help gather the fringe together. When Queen Alexandra died in 1925, the Kokoshnik was inherited by her daughter-in-law, Queen Mary. A fitting choice, since it was famously worn by Alexandru at Mary's wedding. Queen Mary died in 1953, and along with most of the rest of her property, she bequeathed the tiara to her granddaughter, Queen Elizabeth II. The piece quickly became a central part of Elizabeth's jewelry collection. There are tiaras, and then there are masterpieces. Today's tiara definitely falls into the latter category. One of the most stunning tiaras in the collections of the extended British royal family, the Fife tiara was given to Princess Louise. Princess Louise is the granddaughter of Queen Victoria and she was the eldest daughter and third child of Albert Edward, Prince of Wales, and Princess Alexandra who later became Edward VII and Queen Alexandra. The Fife tiara is made on an extremely intricate and delicate frameworks, and it contains diamonds ranging in weight from 1 to 10 carats. It was made in five pieces, and almost like one now. The tiara is extraordinary in its construction, silver in the front, gold in the back, and all of the 200 carats of diamonds, beautifully cut, while being presented in the thinness framework. But what really extraordinary is the tiny pivots in which the bear-shaped diamonds are presented, and they would have caught the light, when Louise Duchess of Fife worn it, it would be an extremely beautiful to behold. Third on the list is the Brazilian Aquamarine Tiara. Most of the sparkling tiaras worn by Queen Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom were legacies from queens and princesses past, but a few of them have been hand-picked or commissioned by the Queen herself. Today's tiara, the Brazilian Aquamarine, was ordered by the Queen as a part of an evolving parure of jewels. The Brazilian Aquamarine parure didn't start with a tiara, it began with a necklace and a pair of earrings. These diamond and aquamarine pieces were presented to the Queen in 1953 by the Brazilian President as a coronation gift on behalf of the people of Brazil. By 1957, the Queen had also commissioned Garrett to make a tiara to match the aquamarine de May parure. The tiara featured an elaborate diamonds, and aquamarine band base, with three aquamarine and diamond elements placed at intervals. The Queen has worn the tiara fairly consistently since its overhaul, even though it's now one of the tallest and most imposing diadems in her collection. The last time we saw her wear the tiara in public was during the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Australia in October 2011. <laughs> Queen Victoria and Prince Albert's shared love of art and design resulted in many an exquisite treasure, including jewels like her sapphire coronet and the oriental circlet. Albert has such taste and arranges everything for me about my jewels, Victoria wrote. This Gothic-inspired emerald and diamond tiara is another example, a piece personally designed by Prince Albert and commissioned in 1845 from the London jeweller Joseph Kitching for £1,150. The tiara, nearly a full circlet in shape, has a base of cushion-shaped diamonds and step-cut emeralds topped by a graduated row of 19 inverted pear-shaped emeralds. The largest emerald weighs in at 15 carats. The tiara completed a pair of emeralds and diamonds previously gifted to the queen by her husband, including a necklace with nine clusters of emeralds surrounded by cushion-shaped diamonds, a pair of pendant earrings, and a brooch featuring a 20-carat emerald. Queen Victoria was thrilled with her emerald tiara gift referring to it as a lovely diadem of diamonds and emeralds designed by my beloved Albert and writing of her husband's wonderful taste in her journal. The family has allowed the tiara to be shown on exhibition, and, of course, 
has just now loaned it on a long-term basis to the Victoria Revealed exhibition at Kensington Palace alongside the Fife Tiara and the Fife Fringe Tiara. The rest of the Emerald Parure is also on show, ready and waiting for your admiration. It already has mine, this is one of my absolute favorite pieces. Magnificent. This unique emerald tiara was made by Harry Winston in 1958 in advance of the marriage of the Shah of Iran and Farah Deba. Much like the Nor Orlane tiara, which was made in the same time frame for the same purpose, it includes a mix of diamond colors and incorporates old stones from the Iranian crown collection. The heart-shaped pointed base is made of a row of platinum set baguette white diamonds which sit underneath a double row of pink, yellow, and white diamonds. The brilliants are thought to be from the 19th century and Indian in origin, the largest two are 15 carats apiece, the top is set with seven large oval and round cup oaken emeralds which are probably from South America and were likely cut before 1738, when Nadia Shah invaded India. The emeralds range in size from 10 carats each, for the two smallest, to 65 carats, for the large central stone, and are framed in diamonds thought to be from South Africa. The tiara may have been a signature piece for the Empress, but it belonged to the Crown Jewel collection and as such did not come with her when the Imperial family fled the country in 1979. While they are no longer worn, the jewels are safe and sound and available for public viewing at the Treasury of National Jewels in the Central Bank of the Islamic Republic of Iran in Tehran. I hope you had a wonderful time viewing some of the most beautiful tiaras made for the royalties, nobles, and pageantry. It was a pleasure. Have a wonderful day. Rolls-Royce makes some of the world's most luxurious cars. Known for producing handcrafted automobiles that promise a seamless magical carpet ride for its customers, a Rolls-Royce car does not come cheap. These are some of the best-selling Rolls-Royce models. And these are their entry-level prices. But with virtually unlimited optional extras, upgrades and customizations, the true cost of a bespoke Rolls-Royce has no limits. In fact, Rolls-Royce refuses to even discuss its base prices. There isn't really a specific base price which we would just discuss because it really depends on each customer as an individual and the bespoke options which they like to, to design and develop with our, with our bespoke team. So what are some of these bespoke extras? And is that what makes Rolls-Royce so expensive? One of the first obvious starting points probably is the colour. We have a palette of 44,000 plus colours. We replicate people's lipsticks, um, something from your house, something your own, something you've seen. Even we've done the dog of an owner, a red setter. So we exactly replicate them, whether it be by uh, the DNA, the chemistry or whatever. For us, it's unique. It'll be registered as your colour and you can give it a name and it's yours. And if someone else has seen it and wants to use that exact finish, we have to go to that person and ask their permission. When we go to the paint shop, you'll see it's called the Surface Finish Center because it's a bit of an insult to say, we're painting the car. It's more than that. You're gonna have at least some layers of coat. Uh, there's primers, there's base coats, there's color. And unusually, we put on two clear coats of lacquer. But you could have up to 23 layers of coating, which we've done before, equating to about 45 kilograms in weight, just of coat. In addition to the endless variations of colour, Rolls-Royce customers can infuse their paint with materials to create special effects. One particularly wealthy customer went one step further, requesting the addition of a thousand diamonds. We wanted a bit more sparkle in the finish, so it gave us a bag of diamonds. We crushed them, they were infused into the paint. Remarkably, the detailed paintwork on Rolls-Royce cars is done by hand by just one person. My name is Mark Court and I am the coach liner for Rolls Royce Motorcars. A coach liner means that I am able to put this pinstripe onto the side of the car. The uniqueness is the fact that I do it completely freehand and I'm the only one within Rolls Royce that can do this. That's like worldwide within the Rolls Royce BMW group. It's 
So the brushes I use is made of squirrel hair. We found that most brushes nowadays are man-made, and which tends to leave brush marks within these lines. This is a natural hair. This natural hair tends to leave no marks at all. So we work to one standard, which is the highest standard. So we use one that leaves no brush marks at all. And if customers without a coach line decide to add one to their car, Mark is on hand to travel worldwide with his paintbrush. As normal, with Rolls Royce, Rolls Royce never comes back to us, we go to it. So if it's in Dubai, so be it. That's where I have to go. There are several unmistakable features of every Rolls Royce exterior. The handmade Pantheon grille, the self-writing wheel centers that ensure the RR logo is never rotated, and the Spirit of Ecstasy ornament. In fact, in 2003, BMW paid $65 million to acquire the rights to the Rolls-Royce name, symbol, and the Spirit of Ecstasy. But it's inside the car where luxury and cost dramatically increases. To create a virtually silent ride, Rolls-Royce adds approximately 300 pounds of acoustic insulation around the cabin. Its tyre manufacturer, Continental, even developed special foam-filled tyres, which reduced the noise of the road by 9 decibels. The results were so profound that Rolls-Royce removed some soundproofing to avoid causing acoustic sensory deprivation. The dashboard of the Rolls-Royce Phantom can even become a bespoke art gallery. Customers have commissioned artists to produce all sorts of designs for this space, including this gold-plated, 3D-printed, stainless steel installation that replicates the customer's DNA profile. Another shining feature of Rolls-Royce is the Starlight Headliner, an intricate series of fibre-optic roof lights that recreate the night sky. It takes up to 16 hours to build the Starlight Headliners. We're starting by drilling it and we perforate every single uh, hole to thread fiber optic through every single um, hole. We've got up to 1,340 holes. We're doing this to achieve the stars yeah, that are on the sky. So we're going to have the sky in the night <laughs> covered with uh, stars. As with all things Rolls-Royce, customers can create bespoke starlight designs, including randomly generated shooting stars. One customer even had their design matched to exactly replicate the constellation of stars from the night they were born. The embroidery on the upholstery is also tailor-made to the customer's design choice. So there's no real standard process that's repeated with embroidery just because every single design is completely unique to the customer. It's not just a case of scanning in an image, turning it into embroidery. Every single aspect of the image is thought out. The different angles of the stitch will reflect the light in a different way. So rather than it just being a flat image, we're trying to bring it out to that next level. So it's almost three-dimensional, like a hologram effect that you can get from our stitching. The most complex embroidery project Rolls-Royce has completed is this special Rose Phantom model, which consists of one million individual stitches. The Rose Phantom is the biggest embroidery we've done to date. We'll have to map out exactly what order we're putting all those embroideries onto the leather so that they all join up to match some of the stitching. There's no tolerance, it can't be out by a millimetre, otherwise it's completely written off. Just take a small aspect of the Rose Phantom. It's a good example of the development of one of the butterflies. What seems relatively simple in like an image actually becomes very complex for embroidery. So for the Phantom Rose Headliner, there's a few techniques that we hadn't used before. Because of the, the scale of the Rose Headliner, uh, we had to break it down into individual elements. So each individual butterfly, the flower heads themselves, and then all the vines and leaves. So you can see here, it's basically different layering of different colored stitches in different densities. And by building those up, we can create that sort of fade effect where it's darker to the center, fades out towards the wings, fine tune them to the quality that we'd expect, and then start combining it and bringing it all together for the whole headliner. Rolls-Royce has seen a boom in sales over the last 10 years. In 2019, sales increased by roughly 25% to 5,152 units, with the average age of a Rolls-Royce owner dropping from late 50s to mid 40s. Take Drake, for example. His Bashukan model, a special edition of the Phantom, left the factory at a value of about $700,000.
However, the customizations that Drake made, such as the diamond encrusted Ovo Owl in place of the Spirit of Ecstasy, is thought to have brought the overall price to about $1 million. The most expensive Rolls-Royce model ever built was the Sweptail. The result of over four years' work, this one-of-a-kind car was reported to cost $13 million, previously holding the title of the world's most expensive new car. But while other top-end car manufacturers focus on speed, maneuverability, and super lightweight supercar status, Rolls-Royce cars are expensive for one reason. Luxury. So with Michael Jordan being worth $2 billion, cashing out on Ferraris, buying his own private golf course, and even copying a $30 million jet, it's just the beginning of his stupidly expensive purchases. Now one of Michael's most recent purchases came here at the beginning of 2019 where he was spotted celebrating on an $80 million yacht. The yacht is actually so big that by lot requires a professional crew on board at all times. But with that being said, there's plenty of room for any activities with a full indoor bar decorated in a tropical theme with special hardwood, eight sleeping cabins, a gym, and jacuzzi as well. Then the outdoor includes dining areas as well, even its own basketball court on board. And according to TMZ, the yacht itself costs $840,000 a week to maintain and keep functioning perfectly. Now back in 2015, Jordan cashed on a Gulfstream G4 private jet, and he had it wrapped in the UNC white and light blue with the Jordan brand logo on the back wing, as well as it labeled N236MJ, standing for the number on his jersey of 23, the number of NBA championships he won with 6, and of course his initials. Now before the upgrades or any cosmetic work was done, the private jet came at a base price of nearly $36 million, and then he added luxuries like custom Rolls Royce engines and being able to sit 19 passengers. But in 2017, Jordan decided to give the plane a makeover with a brand new paint job that happened to be Jordan's specific design that's been used for many of his signature shoes. The new elephant print style now covered the entire plane with colors of urban camouflage, which is popular to the retro Air Jordan 3s. So with both of these paint jobs coming in around $700,000 for both of them, the total price of this jet is nearly $50 million. Now Jordan happened to be introduced to golf by his college roommate just weeks before he left to join the NBA. But Jordan followed his hidden talent very well over the years and eventually played with icons like Tiger Woods on a regular basis, bought a massive mansion on a private golf course, and then he came out in early 2018 making it public he was going to open up his very own golf course in Florida, just north of West Palm Beach. The course itself would primarily be private and would be called Grove 23, but it would allow close friends and family as well as pro golfers or anyone highly recommended by MJ himself. A close friend and golf partner of Jordan over the years actually said his reason for wanting to build his own course was that Michael likes to play fast and he can't stand when people won't let him through. That happens enough out there that he's gotten fed up. He just steps up, hits, chews your ears off with smack talk, and off he goes. If he knows the guys he's with, he'll not even wait. He'll drive up to the green as your back is in the fairway hitting. The course itself will include a private club for residents and members, a driving range, 9,800 square foot clubhouse, and maintenance facilities for any golfer on the course. But the course itself covers 223 acres with hills and many trees that flow throughout the St. Lucie River, and it was estimated to be worth 15 to 20 million dollars when he was initially having it built, but would cost a couple million dollars annually to maintain. Now Jordan himself has heavily been into cars ever since he joined the league and beyond. One of Jordan's prized possessions is his Aston Martin DB7 that was estimated to be worth around $200,000 but it was actually gifted to him by the manufacturer, and they gave him the car in a special red variant that wouldn't be put on any of the other cars similar to it being sold. Jordan also flaunts his red and black $115,000 Porsche 911 Turbo that was actually an inspiration to one of his iconic shoe designs, but MJ himself actually owned many different models of Porsches all at the same time during his days with the Chicago Bulls, a 930, 964, and 993. Even Michael's very own Air Jordan 6 shoes were actually inspired by his red and black 911, with the shoe itself being shaped like the car as well as the black and red color scheme. Another car that MJ's been spotted in many times is a $212,000 custom Ferrari 512 Testarossa, which happens to be one of his favorites and he's been spotted in multiple versions of it. He's had one black and one bright red and it even had the license plate M Air J and it's also a modified special model that few people in the world actually have. But back in 2007, 
Jordan cashed out on a very rare edition of a car that cost him nearly a half million dollars. This Mercedes-Benz McLaren version, an SLR 722, had butterfly doors as well as engine and suspension upgrades to make it better for racing, and it cost Jordan 450000 But it didn't last long in MJ's garage, as it ended up on eBay just a few years later with less than a thousand miles on it. But over the years, Jordan's garage have constantly been filled with a variety of unique cars. He said certain ones personally customized by DreamWorks Motorsports, including multiple Range Rovers, a Bentley Continental GT, and multiple Mercedes-Benz. MJ's even had multiple Ferraris including a 599 and has been spotted in and around many Corvettes as well. So with Michael Jordan being recognized as the greatest player of all time, his NBA resume is easily one of the most impressive that we've ever seen. So it's only right that MJ's been living good all of these years with his ridiculous mansion collection. Now we all know that MJ resided in Chicago for most of his professional career, but nearly a decade after retiring for the first time, MJ cashed out on a $12 million home in Jupiter, Florida, where he paid $4.8 million for the land and $7.6 million for the construction of the home, making this mansion one of the most expensive homes in the Palm Beaches. But MJ, who says he's an everyday golfer nowadays, actually bought this home from legendary Jack Nicklaus and is ironically right down the street from Tiger Woods as well. But back in 2010, Jordan said that he golfed sunrise to sunset while his family enjoys everything else about the stunning 28,000 square foot home. This massive three acre mansion consists of a guard house, a guest house, and a pool house, but Jordan's home itself consists of 11 bedrooms, 6 on the second floor alone, a huge media room with state of the art electronics, and also an athletic wing together with basketball court and workout facility. Having said all of that, since moving in, Jordan has had over $7 million in renovations put into this home, making it worth nearly $20 million present day. Now obviously with Michael Jordan creating such a legacy in Chicago, it's only right that he still spends time there today. And just a few years after he retired from the Wizards, he bought a 56,000 square foot home in Highland Park, Illinois that has everything a legend needs, from an infinity pool with a grass hill in the middle, a custom door from the Playboy Mansion, and even his Jumpman logo on all of the golf flags around the premises. But with that being said, the home includes a putting green, tennis court, and even a pond filled with fish. Now up to this point, if you've seen anything to do with this home, the main gate of his mansion has the number 23 on it, and it's pretty much turned into a tourist attraction for the city. But the area as a whole consists of seven acres, while on the inside it includes an NBA regulation court branded with his logo, a piano room, a cigar room, an aquarium actually built into the wall, a skylight over the kitchen, 9 bedrooms, and 19 bathrooms. Of course, it includes yet again a media room, as well as a full-size gym with every piece of equipment necessary, and it was actually stated that some of Jordan's Bulls teammates came to work out here every morning. But when Jordan bought the home for roughly $25 million, he originally had plans to make it his primary home, but becoming such a golfer after his basketball days, MJ decided to make the Florida home his main destination, and he eventually put this Highland Park house up for sale at 30 million, but it sits on the market still today. Now in February of 2013, Jordan purchased a huge mansion in Charlotte, North Carolina during a foreclosure sale, so it was for much cheaper than the house was actually worth. But it makes sense that he did so, seeing as he spent most of his childhood in the state, played in college there for the Tar Heels, and of course he became a majority owner of the Charlotte Hornets. But this 12,000 square foot mansion only costed MJ 2.8 million after the house was listed at 3.5 million and it sits on North Carolina's Lake Norman. It includes six bedrooms, eight bathrooms, full library, a vintage wooden in-home elevator with built-in telephone on the wall inside, a two-story great room that opens to a terrace patio with enormous pool and spa, and a basement with personal gym and entertainment center. The lakefront home also happens to sit right off the seventh hole in the Peninsula Club golf course, which suits Jordan well. Now with Michael Jordan growing up in North Carolina as well as playing college ball there, with his playing days in the NBA being over, he still continues to be heavily involved in the league as he invested into the Charlotte team which was the Bobcats back in 2006, but just a few years later in 2010, Jordan made it public he wanted to own the team, and he purchased them outright for a reported $275 million. Shortly after, Jordan came out and said, Purchasing the Bobcats is the culmination of my post-playing career goal of becoming the majority owner of an NBA franchise. I am especially pleased to have the opportunity to build a winning team in my home state of North Carolina. I plan to make this franchise an organization that Charlotte can be proud of, and I'm committed to doing all that I can to achieve this goal. Now according to Forbes, the Hornets franchise is now worth around $1.25 billion. With MJ spending a short time playing professional baseball as well, he's actually looking to own an MLB team on top of this, and he recently spent $5 million to have a stake in the Miami Marlins. Now just like the rare type of player that Jordan was, his watch collection is just as unique. At a Jordan brand photo shoot that also included Dwayne Wade, 
Jordan and Wade both stuck out their hands with Jordan shoes in each. And Jordan was rocking one of his $40,000 Euless Nardin Sonata watches that's white gold and has a huge face with a big date and countdown mechanism. In a promotional interview for his brand, MJ was rocking a Richard Milley RM32 covered in red gold and was the larger style coming in at 50mm. The Richard Milley watch cost them $125,000, and respectfully so, with a full titanium build and big rubber strap. In 2005, Jordan was pictured wearing a UR203 watch made by Your Work that cost Jordan roughly $230,000. The watch is known for being quite special with its design, being unlike many other watches as well as it working off satellites, and it even has telescoping hands. In a picture taken of Jordan courtside at a Bobcats game in 2013, he was spotted rocking a stunning $75,000 Rolex Daytona Platinum. Jordan had the new 2013 50th Anniversary Platinum Edition, where the face is a seafoam light green color with brown edging all along the sides with a diamond bezel. And lastly, at the 2019 NBA All-Star Weekend in Charlotte, during a press conference, Jordan was spotted wearing another unique piece, this time a red gold Big Pilots watch that was actually limited to only 250 ever made. With it being priced around 32000 this Anton de Saint had a red gold case as well as an annual calendar display. Now of course with MJ being so legendary, anything sold to Michaels after his playing days is something worth treasuring since his legacy isn't disappearing anytime soon, and lots of expensive memorabilia of Jordan's has been sold recently. Upper Deck, which is a popular sports car business, actually bought the entire hardwood floor that Jordan won his final championship on. Upper Deck bought the Delta Center's floor for $1 million, and although there's not details on what they did with it, I'm sure they incorporated it into many products. Another crazy piece of memorabilia that was actually sold was a basketball signed by the two icons that went by the initials MJ, Michael Jordan and Michael Jackson, but they both signed this one-of-a-kind basketball after they both shot the music video Jam for Michael Jackson that happens to feature Jordan a bunch throughout and has 55 million views on YouTube. But one lucky fan purchased this signed ball for $294,000, which is one of the, if not the most expensive basketball in history. Now, nobody created more hype in college sports than Michael Jordan, and that's exactly why game worn UNC jerseys are almost impossible to find, with them starting at $100,000 to even get your hands on one. But one person did buy one of Jordan's game worn jerseys from his sophomore season, and it sold for $114,000 a few years ago. Legendary sports cards that are signed by a player, have pieces of their jersey in it, or are of their rookie seasons are hard to come by but recently someone bought a 1986 rookie Michael Jordan card for $100,000, which is a record for the most ever spent on one card. And this card is unique because it was actually graded a perfect 10 out of 10 in all categories. Now, one of the greatest plays in sports history is Michael Jordan's final shot in Game 6 of the 1998 NBA Finals, where with 16 seconds left in the game down by one, he got a steal and took it the length of the court, crossed up, and hit his famous shot, leaving five seconds on the clock and going up on the Jazz by one, basically securing them the championship. This was Jordan's final shot of his Chicago career, and a fan actually ended up purchasing the rim and backboard that he hit that shot on for 57000 Now go check out what the NBA will look like in 2020, and subscribe to stay up to date with the NBA 100%.